Well, first of all, welcome everybody um, to the, uh, the 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 June um, the June, I suppose, version of the uh, of the Sustainable Futures Seminar Series. Um, thank you very much for joining us, um, and I'm pleased to introduce a couple of really excellent speakers today on some very interesting topics. Um, first of all, Ron Chan uh, from University of Manchester will we'll, we'll talk and then that will be followed by uh, Izzy Stevens from the University of Birmingham. I'll introduce Izzy just before her talk. Um, Ron is a, a senior lecturer in environmental economics. Um, he's interested in studying a wide range of policy issues. Um, he joined us in 2014 um, and he's been here since. Uh, he was at the University of Maryland before where he did his PhD and he studies a wide range of, uh, of, of challenges in the, the pollution, energy transition and climate change space. Uh, so over to you, Ron. Right, thank you, Hugh, for the um, uh, kind words introduction. Uh, so let me just share my screen um, here. All right, I hope everybody can, can see it. All right. Right, okay, so uh, today I'm going to, in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to, um, briefly introduce things I've been working on um, and some exciting things we are going to start doing in the next couple of uh, years. Um, so the title of the work is, our title of the presentation today is Air Pollution, Smoky Days and Hours Worked. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, basically about the non-health impact of air pollution a little bit. And then I'm going to dive in to talk about a little bit about um, the impact of air pollution on the labor market in Chile, which was something that I've been working on in the last uh, two or three years. Uh, so that work is not only my work, so it's joint work with two of my colleagues. Uh, one is uh, Martino Pelli, University of Sherbrooke, who is moving to the Asia Development Bank uh, next month. And then we also have one of my former PhD students, Veronica. Uh, she has taken a job at University of Huddersfield last year. Uh, so yeah, but we are all in good contact and very uh, active WhatsApp group and all that. All right, so, all right, so thank, thanks to Quebec um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, we are not particularly unfamiliar with air pollution. All right, and uh, so this is just a snapshot of a picture that I got it from uh, New York Times AFP. So this basically is what New York City looks like uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and the reason why we have like the like basically yellow ish is because there was a wildfire happening in Quebec, which is north of New York City, not that far away, right? So now, of course, there are a lot of tweets going on on what actually happened. Oh, don't worry, uh, because China is like this every day. Uh, but uh, since we're all scientists in this room, uh, I will tell you that it's something that we need to worry about. Uh, and the thing that we will be focusing on in this talk is something called fine particulate matters, uh, PM 2.5. You know, some of you are probably very familiar with this, uh, but basically what, what we are looking at is uh, the red ones that you can see there. This is a picture taken from the US EPA. So uh, there are basically fine particulate matter is something that is uh, very small. Right? So you can, see, uh, you can see basically a very uh, big picture of a uh, human hair. Uh, and the PM 2.5 is, uh, PM 10 is uh, the basic particular matters, uh, and PM 2.5 is even smaller than PM 10, right? So it's very, very small. It goes into the inner part of our lung and cause health problems, right? So so why, why does it matter? Uh, well, first of all, I will show you that it matters. So this is uh, basically very quickly just pulling PM 2.5 uh, data from, from in New York City uh, in the past couple of days, as you will see that around the wildfire uh, that you see the PM 2.5 level goes all the way up, right, to um, to 150 or above 150. And the, if I'm not mistaken, I think the, uh, the basically the uh, World Health Organization guidelines like 15 uh, or even lower, I think now that uh, micrograms. So this is way higher than what the WHO recommends, right? So, so even before the wildfire, you can see the when New York City is not doing particularly well because of, of course, of all these urban things and all that, right? So this is not a very new issue that we know that in the, we, we do have a lot of people studying these kind of problems. 
So in public health literature and in epidemiology literature, we have been focusing a lot of impacts on, um, on health impact, right? So health impact is kind of a broad term, like we can look at uh, hospitalization, infant mortality. So in economics, there has also been a considerable amount of empirical work using secondary, secondary data to look at these kind of things, right? And, and, uh, and let's say the hospitalization fronts, Schrenker and Walker, they look at um, when there are delays in the uh, LA airports, uh, that leads to a lot of like idle, idle airplanes and then they still give out emissions even though they're not flying. And then they found that that leads to increase in carbon monoxide and that leads to a huge increase in cost of hospitalization. And then you also have infant mortality, which is like, or even adult mortality that uh, we found in Mexico City uh, that a 1% increase in PM10 uh, can lead to like, um, 0.4% increase in infant mortalities in Mexico City. And then what's really interesting about that study is that um, they found that the, this effect was actually is quite big, 1% increase in PM10 is to 0.4% increase in infant mortality. And this effect is considerably larger compared to other US studies, right? That suggested, although there are a lot of reasons that I cannot go into detail, uh, but uh, developing countries, uh, we do see a much, much stronger, strongly negative effect in the in in environmental pollution um, for for many reasons uh, that I'm happy to elaborate if, if any people um, um, have uh, have any interest in that. So today I'm going to shift our attention to to health uh, away from health impact, not because health impact is not important, but it's because now in economics or also in in science we also found that uh, actually even though we are not dying or we are not going to um, to the hospital, there's still a lot of ways that the PM level, uh, the pollution can actually affect us in many ways. So today I'm going to mostly focus on these so-called cognitive outcomes. Basically there are a lot of uh, scientific evidence to show that the PM can actually affect how our brain functions in some sense affect the judgments that we have. All right, so then there are very interesting studies. I mean, that's not what I teach my PhD student, uh, but, but because I don't have two hours here, so I can just condense into four bullet points. So, uh, so these are four very interesting studies. The first one actually looks at Israel. So they, they, they found that uh, if you are doing the exam in a poor environmental, like basically you're doing the exam in a high pollution environment, then it leads to a low exam score. And not only that, uh, because in the low exam score, you can't get into the university that you want to get into and so on, that also leads to a lifetime earning reduction. Right? So that's a very impactful study. Uh, it also affects uh, mental health. So in the, I think in the US, in this study, um, and then there's more traffic accident uh, and more crime using data in London. Um, so, so there are actually quite a lot of, um, so not just about health, but also nowadays we figure that air pollution can actually affect us in many, many different ways. So to understand why this is important, at least in an economic sense, uh, what, so I'm just quoting this study by um, Deshle Patch, Rivers and Stadler in OECD. Uh, so this is a map of Europe. And basically what they do is to basically look at the uh, economic performance in each of these cells that you can see uh, and correlated with the PM level. Uh, of course, we're trying to find some causal uh, relationship between PM and uh, GDP. So the instrument they're using here is uh, they use is still called thermal inversion. Uh, episodes in which we uh, human activities wise is the same, but there are some days or there's some years in particular that there's uh, some phenomena in atmosphere that basically uh, lower the pressure, uh, lower the boundary layer and trap the pollution and, and increase the pollution. So that's the way that they used to, to isolate the correlation. And basically what they found is that a one, a one microgram uh, per cubic meter increase in PM2.5 leads to 1% reduction in GDP, now, which is quite big. Of course, a one, one microgram increase in the, in the sense of, in the case of Europe, is also quite big because as you can see from here, that the average is about eight or nine. So uh, of course, some places are much bigger, but one is actually like almost bigger than 10% increase. But still, that basically means that uh, GDP like was affected as a result of, uh, of PM. So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to try to focus on uh, the labor market, right? Um, so how the labor market works is that, um, of course, we believe that uh, workers are getting less productive in their work simply because they can't concentrate on their work, right? As I said, mentioned before. 
uh, we found that, uh, at least in the, the broad literature in economics, we found that the um, uh, air pollution does affect our cognitive ability or, or the function. And then uh, it actually links quite a lot to also human capital formation. So, so, it's kind of, so in, in the layman terms, you can think about this as just education, right? Um, so, so we are actually starting a study in Chile that actually we do have basically all the uh, performance and uh, class attendance in Chile. And what we're going to do is that we are going to look at how air pollution affects how people attend class and, and how does it affect their grades and how does that affect what kind of like uh, income or, or jobs they get into, right? So you have, you could, so like um, contemporaneous change in air pollution can actually have some long-term consequences. So I think that's the, uh, that, that makes it quite important uh, to, to, to focus on. Uh, so, so a lot of attention so far have been looking at labor productivity in many different angles. So, so in 2012, this paper, seminal paper actually started kind of this literature by focusing on uh, pear pickers in, um, in uh, California, right? And it has now been extended to a wide setting. So uh, we can manufacturing workers you know, in the US, in, in Europe, but also in, um, in China. And then there are also a lot of attention looking at like um, a very niche kind of jobs. The reason why we're looking at this kind of niche jobs is because we kind of know how to measure productivity, right? So let's say for pear pickers, we know how many pairs they pick every hour. For baseball umpires, uh, if you do play baseball, uh, the umpire, the one sitting at the back of the one that catches the, the baseball has to call whether a ball is good or bad, right? So, so basically they got all the data from the, uh, the Major League Beast Baseball to know the percentage of mistakes that these umpires make and then how does that relate to the pollution that they face there and controlling for visibility and all that. Uh, recently, there's a very interesting paper that focuses on programmers. Uh, so basically, what they do is that they gather the data on the on the GitHub programmers, right? So basically, uh, and then they look at how many um, how many commits they have done. Uh, basically, it's like some if you get an update of the code, then you send a commit, and then they look at like how many uh, like they work, and then they also have the address of the programmers, and they also found that uh, in, on the days where air pollution is high they basically work less, all right, or, or they're less productive in that sense. All right, so, so what we are trying to think about is that, okay, great, uh, or, or bad, that when, they, when you go to work, um, that uh, you don't really, um, you can't really concentrate on, on working. But what if, but does it actually change whether you go to work or not, which is basically the focus of what we are focusing on. So, so for the remaining couple of minutes, I'm trying to, uh, elaborate a little bit about what we are studying in, in Chile in, in four slides, so very, very quick. So that's why we are, instead of studying labor productivity, we also wanted to study working hours. Basically, whether if you are uh, on a day where air pollution is lower, do you actually adjust your working hours, right? Do you actually work less? Do you work more? Or does it depend on anything else, right? So. So basically what we're trying to look at is that uh, actually the effect on the labor market might actually be bigger than we thought because previously we think that, okay, we have 10 people, 10 people work 35 hours a week and then each, each hour they work less or they were not able to produce as much output as they, as they wish. So that's why that's an economic out, um, impact. But what we are trying to look at here is that uh, perhaps they work less than 35 hours, right? So, okay, you go to work, but then you, you were not able to work as much, right? So, so that's why we might be underestimating the impact on the labor market if we just focus on labor productivity. And the question is that how much are we underestimating? There's something we want to address in this paper. And instead of looking at a particular niche occupation, because you might say, oh, why should I care about the number of mistakes a baseball umpire is making? So that's why we are looking at a nationwide labor market, right, in Chile. Um, using remote sensing data on air pollution and wildfire smoke. Well, I'll explain why we need a wildfire smoke to study the air pollution and, uh, and the labor market. Uh, so we're focused on the entire population. So we're also able to disaggregate the impact to look at who are the people who are actually really getting negatively affected by air pollution uh, based on whether they are, they're rich, where they're poor, uh, do they work outdoor, do they work indoor? 
uh, what kind of occupation do they have, and male, female, uh, whether they have kids at home, and so on. So we're able to disentangle a lot of these um, different dimensions uh, using the data that we have. Right, so, so what kind of data do we have? We have some secondary source data. Uh, it's like a, basically a, la a labor market survey that conducted by the Chilean government uh, every year. Uh, so we collected data to record their actual and contract working hours every week, not every week, in that particular week. So let's say you get a survey this week to your home and they said, okay, how much, how much hour have you worked the week after, uh, the week before, sorry. Uh, and then you said, oh, okay, I work like 35. And then they will also ask you how much do you usually work, right? Or what, what does your contract say? How many hours have you worked? And you said, oh, okay, uh, I work 36, right? So meaning one hour less. Right, so, so they will ask also a bunch of reasons why did you work an hour less, of course they can choose not to answer, um, but the most important thing we're going to look at is those two, right, actual and contract working hours. So then, uh, we, of course, they also record what kind of jobs are you into, where you live, uh, how much income do you have, uh, how many kids you have in your household, etc. You ask a bunch of information on their socioeconomic status. Then we are basically bringing it together with um, remote sensing data on air pollution, uh, wind, and the wildfire location. So the reason why we are doing that is that we also were, were curious in looking at how wildfires, smoke, uh, of course, leads to a lot of PM, as you will see at the beginning of the presentation. How does that also affect their working hours? Right? But then, because we don't actually have the wildfire smoke data, uh, but we have a bunch of things that relate to wildfire smoke, so we know where the wildfire is, we know how many days have they been burning. We know the particular wind direction and wind speed uh, on that particular location. So that's why we're able to basically predict a smoke plume, like this little corn, uh, this little cone that you see in, on, in, on the slide, to basically predict where the smoke plume is going to affect, like which, uh, which, which places that uh, that particular wildfire is going to affect. Um, so the challenge uh, to study these kind of things is to basically isolate because uh, basically we are trying to drive a causal impact of air pollution rather than just look at a correlation between air pollution and working hours. And one of the hardest uh, problem to address here is the, re the reverse causality and a bunch of other issues too. But you can think that if, I, if we just run a regression or a correlation of the pollution uh, and also working hours, we actually find a positive relationship. And the reason why we have a positive relationship is not because air pollution makes people work harder, it's because there are reverse causality, right? So let's say uh, you drive to work or you take public transportation or you, you, you woke, woke up, you brew a bunch of coffee and you go to work. These are all like would induce pollution. Uh, so basically this is a reverse causality. Basically it's like you work, so lead to more pollution. So need, we need something to isolate uh, air pollution that is not affected by the hours work. So basically what we are doing here is that we use the wildfire smoke because it's exogenously uh, driven by, by uh, some conditions. Uh, and also the wind, because we are looking at the wind uh, that is blown from the wildfire. Um, so we look at how that increased air pollution and how that, that particular increase in wildfire, uh, sorry, particular increase in air pollution does affect the working hours at the end. All right, so that's basically the focus of our, of our of, of, of the methodology of what we're doing. So basically what we found is that uh, we found that average wildfire, they basically decreased the working hours by approximately one hour for an average worker or approximately 2.5% uh, of, the, of the hours. Uh, we also found that the increase in average PM 2.5 level, uh, uh, it kind of relates, basically uh, wildfire will increase the PM over by approximately one cent deviation. So that's why we got very similar effects. If we just focus on the labor productivity, we will have underestimated the cost by about 12%. Um, so it's not a big impact. So basically productivity is still very important, uh, but the labor supply side or the extensive margin here is also quite, quite important. What's, more, what's also quite interesting is that we actually find air pollution does lead to very negative effect on, on some particular workers. Um, so, let's say for workers who are very poor, uh, let's say below or, or around minimum wage, minimum income, then they do have a much more negative effect, which is up to four times larger uh, for those workers. And, and also we find that the effect also focus on more older side of the park worker compared to um, the average worker. Uh, 
so I think I have running out of time now. So, so thank you so much for uh, actually the paper is on my website. So, so if anybody wants to look at that a bit more, of course, feel free to ask me any questions afterwards. Uh, but um, but the paper uh, paper is there. Um, but uh, we are also starting a lot of new projects looking at the impact of air pollution on labor productivity, labor supply, education outcomes, and all that. So so I'm excited to hear what you think and uh, hopefully inspire uh, more topics uh, in case I don't have enough time. So so but thank you so much uh, for your attention. That's great. Thank you ever so much, Ron. That was. Uh... Fascinating stuff. Um, questions for Rob? So, well, I mean, given I've got more than a passing interest in this area, Rob, maybe I can kick off anyway. Uh, so so, so it, it's, it strikes me that, that I mean, it, it's all really interesting. You're trying to balance the, the effect on productivity, the effect on, um, on the availability of labor, the, the, the heterogeneity across the different parts of the labor market to, to a major air pollution event. Um, and something that routinely impacts the, some of the major cities in places like Chile. Um, and, and and then the things that you haven't really touched on that are also all all there are the, are the health costs associated with with those self same problems. How do they? How do how do you start thinking about the balancing those different aspects together in an economic framework? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, Hugh, thank thank you. Uh, so. Yeah, health, I so we did some back of envelope calculation. So the survey, unfortunately, that we have is not um it's not in particular um uh health related because it's a labor market survey. So it does not really um know that whether they were really sick and all that. But there was a question in particular in the survey that we did explore. Because as I said earlier, right, uh, they asked you how many hours you worked, how many hours do you usually work? When there's a difference, they ask why. And health is one of the reasons that they said, oh, it's because of health reason and all that. And we found that most of the reasons is health related. Um, so meaning that uh, in particular, I think part of that has already been a little bit captured that, oh, I've been sick. So therefore I, um, I chose not to go to work. Of course, it's just one particular level of, 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 uh, of health. So we used some World Bank reports and we did some back of envelope calculations of our health is still quite big, the impact. So let's say the, um, the, um, the, the World Bank basically thinks that it, it roughly uh, the air pollution cost in Chile is roughly about 4% of GDP in terms of health, right? So health impact. So, so World Bank did a very extensive report with every single country what is the impact of uh, health impact of air pollution. And, and the, from the report, the number is 4%. Our number it's a little bit less than one percent, so meaning that it's it's um, relatively speaking uh, smaller. Uh, but uh, but once you add everything into it, it becomes a little bit bigger. So I think um, this is part of the small component, but I think uh, it kind of inspires to do a little bit more, so that um, there might be a bit more. Um, it will be a bit more relevant once we add up a lot of this non health cost, because it has been seen. I guess the reason why, of course, we focus on health. For, for like everybody here is that the health obviously is the most important cost. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. But I think we're trying to basically emphasize that actually if you add up everything that's not, not to do with health, the effect is even more, right? So it's basically to call that actually we really need to take air pollution like more seriously than before. No, absolutely. But I, I guess that there are also questions around how how do you how do you account for, so I mean, th th this is really useful to link mm. the air pollution health costs and the air pollution, the wider economic losses associated with, with air pollution events. But then there's also a bunch of work that's thinking about the, um, the economic impacts 
of the inefficiencies in the healthcare system. And, and then you run the kind of risk of some sort of double accounting in the in the way you add this this sort of stuff up. So how do you kind of avoid those sorts of issues? Mm. Yeah, so I think in this case, yeah, it is a difficult thing, especially as I said, part of the reason why you have absenteeism in work is might be to do with health. So if I add that to the whatever World Bank calculated, World Bank has probably calculated something like this too. So in this particular project, we're unable to do that. That's why we just focus on the, um, the labor market front. Uh, so we were not able to say so much about the health. So we are right now we are we are getting a lot of uh, administrative data from France. Now that we know quite a lot of things about them, uh, so we can match it to a lot of like health uh, outcome. We can match it to firms. We can match it to like a lot of things. So we we know exactly how air pollution. We can have a more complete picture on how air pollution affect that particular person. So then in that case, we were then able to isolate the impact of health. Uh, but for this particular project, we yeah, I, I we acknowledge that we are unable to to do that. Okay. Um... I've I've got a ton of questions, but does anybody else have any questions? I've got to be mindful of the time as well. I'm doing two things at once here, checking the time and and uh, and I'm getting interested in what you're talking about. Um, so so one of the I suppose one of the big questions here is, I mean the Chilean Chilean case is great in the sense that, and we did some work looking at air pollution and the health impact working alongside Leeds um, with some work we did on the other side of South America many, many moons ago, thinking about forest fires in the Amazon and, 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 and the impact of the outflow through a lot of cities in the southern part of Brazil. And it's quite it, the nice thing about it from a study perspective, it's pretty unpleasant if you're living there, but from a from from a study perspective, mm -hmm. it's extremely episodic and very, very high levels of pollution. Mm -hmm. So the exposure is incredibly acute and quite widespread, which gives you an enormous signal against the noise. If you were to start to think about um, the um, impacts of say, nitrogen oxides in the UK, which are sort of much more chronic across the population, mm -hmm. how, do you think you go about addressing those sorts of questions? That it's quite a diff different approach, I would think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is always. Um, I mean, when I every time I talk to even my non-environmental colleagues in economics, that's the only. There's also the thing they were kind of curious about. Uh, does it make you more like long term or like chronic? As as you said, Hugh, that. Uh, um, so there's something we also want to address in the French project uh, following up on that. Um, so basically it's kind of accumulation of, of pollution, how does that affect? The, 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 not re as, really as a defense, but I think the, a lot of people, including us, focus on the contemporaneous um, changes. It's probably because it's much easier to isolate the causal impacts that way. Because we can focus on, like, let's say, well, fast smoke, oh, the pollution is really high today. Um, and then we focus on, um, like, let's say, thermal inversion, or oh, these particular days of these particular weeks are really bad. Uh, pollution uh, tend to be higher um, uh, if, on those weeks. Chronic, or if we look at want to look at long term exposure, then we have to ex understand why, like, you have to kind of explain why these guys keep exposing to. To high pollution, of course, they might luck here is a little bit uh, more tricky to defend because you can say, oh, like one of the issue that we have to worry about is why why are they there, right? Or it might be because they they couldn't have moved, right? So let's say if I if I because they could have adapt, right? Oh, okay, I know there's so much pollution, so okay, let me try to move somewhere else to to adapt, right? So that's why the ones we're really focusing on perhaps are the part of the population rather than the entire population. So that's, so that's really, that's the hardest part. Although I, I completely agree that I think from a policy perspective, I think that's really important to, to know. Um, back in the COVID times, yeah, we, we were also even thinking about, um, I think there are also study looking at whether 
does COVID actually uh, affect people uh, in high pollution areas more than low pollution areas? Um, simply because in high pollution area, it might have affected your lung capacity a bit more. Um, and then once COVID hits, then they get more sick than other people. So, so that's more like a long-term comparison. Um, uh, of course, we, there's some correlation that we looked at. Um, so let's say, Mon let's say uh, Mongolia has one of these like highest pollution uh, yeah. places and, and they, they, they suffer really badly from COVID. Uh, but of, of course, it's one data point. So it's not much we can say causally, but, but there's definitely something really interesting. And I don't think there's a lot of there's these um, observational studies on yeah. that using secondary data. Yeah, it's a massive challenge. Yeah. Really, thank, thank you very much, Ron. Um, we, we have to move on. Oops. Um, but uh, I'm tapping all sorts of nonsense here. Um, but but we should we probably should um, we probably should say thank you to Ron. So much appreciated. Um, so we'll, we'll apply the tap the clap function in here if I can actually operate this thing properly. Um, thanks a lot, Ron. And we should move on and and uh, and I should introduce uh, Izzy, who's our next speaker. Um, so. Izzy, Izzy Stevens is, is from the, um, the, the, the Faraday in, um, Institute in, in Birmingham. And uh, uh, Izzy um, is, is, is a PhD student working in, in uh, battery research. Her project focuses on the manufacture and scale up of, of next generation lithium ion cathode materials. And, and she's going to give us a, a bit of an overview of, of the kind of problems and challenges associated with battery technology and, and where I suppose the general field is, is kind of is currently in heading. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll hand over to you, Izzy. Thank you very much. Thanks, you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Here we go. Okay. That's brilliant. We can all see that, Izzy. Perfect. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Izzy, and I am a University of Birmingham PhD student um, sponsored by the Faraday Institution, which is a UK-based uh, battery funding body. Um, I work in the Energy and Materials Group under Emma Kendrick at the University of Birmingham, and my work focuses on sustainable battery materials. So I'm really interested in how that translates to real world applications like electrification of transport, and also how that then interacts with transformation that our society is gonna to need to undertake in order to survive and meet the challenges of climate change. So you've probably all heard of lithium ion batteries, but if you're not quite sure where you might find them, then I have a couple of examples here. So they're used in electric cars, phones, laptops, e-bikes and e-scooters, and even as stationary storage. They were first invented in the 1980s by Sony, and they have since revolutionized portable energy storage. If you've ever wondered how a battery works, here is your slide. So they're used in, so there are three key parts to a lithium ion battery, and that is the cathode, the anode, and the separator. And essentially it works like a seesaw. So we start with lithium ion batteries, lithium ions at the bottom of the seesaw in the cathode. When we charge the battery, we push the lithium ion up the seesaw into the anode, which push by pushing electrons around the circuit. So then when we want to use the battery or discharge it, we let the lithium ions go back down into the cathode, which moves electrons back around the circuit and gives us power, which we can use. So lithium ions don't want to sit at the top of the seesaw, they're much more stable at the bottom, and so they'll happily roll back down into the cathode. And it's this movement of lithium ions from side to side that is essentially how lithium ion batteries work. And the separator is there to stop them rolling back spontaneously and stopping short circuits. So anode material is made out of layers of graphite, so they're flat layers which structurally allows lithium to go in and out as required for the movement of the ions. And cathode material often looks like this one, which is called a layered oxide. So you have layers of atoms of different types of oxygen, uh, transition metal and lithium ions, and lithium can move in and out of these blue layers. 
So the big question is, how do we go from mined metals, so digging rocks out of the ground, to battery technology and electric cars? And there are several stages to that that I'm going to talk you through. So firstly, we have mining. So depending on its form, it might be traditionally digging rocks out of the ground, or with lithium, as in this picture in South America, it's pulling brine from the ground that's rich in lithium. This is the rawest and least pure form of the mineral, and then we refine it to give a much purer version. The refined product might be something like lithium hydroxide, nickel sulfate, or aluminium, or whatever you need to use. So then we use that much purer version to make cathode active material. So cathode active material, so that structure that I showed you on the last slide, it doesn't come like that, so we have to make it by a series of processes, and eventually we end up with what usually is a black powder, and that's what stores lithium within the cathode. So this is then made into electrodes. Electrode just means anode or cathode, it's the collective word for both of them. And for the anodes in lithium iron, because we're using graphite, we don't need to make the anode material in the way that we do with cathode material, so we can just use it and put it, uh, make it straight into an electrode. So those electrodes that we've made then assembled into a cell with a separator and an electrolyte. And the three most common types of cells are shown here. So we've got a couple of different shapes, cylindrical, prismatic, and pouch. And then we put hundreds of those cells together to make a battery pack, which goes into an electric car and powers the car. So the amount of minerals required in an EV are absolutely vast. So this is the visualization of what just of just what one car needs for a battery pack. So you can imagine, so 52 kilograms of graphite, 35 kilograms of aluminium, um, six kilograms of lithium, it's huge. Um, so you can imagine as we get more and more electric vehicles on the road, we're going to need a, a lot more minerals. And that's visualized here, which I will zoom into you from Benchmark Mineral Intelligence, who are a forecasting company. Um, and this is how many mines we're going to need to meet demand by 2035. So here's a zoomed in version. So mines have an average lead time of about 15 years. Um, and we're now 12 years away from 2035. So you can see that if this demand forecast is realized, our demand is going to vastly outstrip our supply uh, because this is the number of mines that we'll need to build and have ready by that time in order to meet supply. So these each little icon on the right representing one mine here. So now I'd like to turn to the other part of my title, which is about climate justice. Um, so climate justice is born from the fact that those that have done the least to cause the climate crisis are those that will suffer the worst consequences from it. The climate crisis will enhance existing inequalities and oppression, which is born from the systems that were used to create that were created to extract and exploit from the global majority for the benefit of a few. In order to fully address the crisis, the climate crisis, we must therefore go to the root of the systems that created it in the first place and address those injustices in order to create a world that is truly for everyone. So, for example, in the Atoll Islands like Kiribati, the Marshall Islands, Tuvalu and the Maldives, they will disappear in the coming decades. Drought combined with flash flooding is killing thousands of people currently in the Horn of Africa in countries like Ethiopia and Somalia. So climate justice for them means funding loss and damage for those countries and allowing them to finance their required adaptation. No person should be left behind in climate justice world, in a climate just world. So that means fully funding retraining in the UK for people like oil workers, airline workers and anyone whose industry will be transformed or eradicated by the need for cleaner tech. It also represents eradic eradicating things like transport poverty by removing the obligation to own expensive cars that consume a considerable part of an income, to move around safely by fully funded and safe and regular public transport as well as bike lanes. Think about the reduction in air pollution, car accidents and the freed up disposable income that, that would then flow within the economy and increase community participation within neighbourhoods. And even closer to home on campuses, climate justice means not allowing fossil fuel companies to promise students long careers that simply can't exist if we're going to meet our climate targets. So I think about the battery industry can be a key player in driving us forward to that world, because being in the intersection of mining and energy gives us the potential to help end colonial systems which rely on extraction and transfer of wealth and resources from the global south to the global north and create fair and just energy systems. So 
extractivism, which is one of these um, systems of oppression, is currently key in the global energy and mining industries. It is exploitation of, of the planet and its people, and it's occurred for over 500 years as colonizing nations accumulated wealth and resources by taking valuable natural assets from countries in the global south via violence and whatever means necessary. And it continues to this day and proliferates environmental racism. The countries that suffer high levels of extractivism often experience high levels of poverty due to their own financial reliance on raw materials rather than developing their own economies, which pollutes their own environment and generates political instability. The wealth of the resource that is taken is often not returned either with no increase in job security and cheaper electricity. And communities that are exploited are often non-white, already marginalised and suffer higher rates of cancer and miscarriage due to the uh, exploitation activity going on. So two really good examples of this are the Niger Delta, where Shell and its subsidiary companies are responsible for thousands of leaks that have displaced whole villages, polluted water and killed crops, totaling over a million and a half barrels of crude oil. This has also resulted in the average life expectancy in the Niger Delta now being 40 years of age, which is 15 years less than the national average. Another example is the Norris nickel mine in Russia, which in 2020 flooded local rivers with thousands of tons of diesel oil. And two years later, uh, three years later, there are still reports of red rivers and contaminated ecosystems. So that's just a couple of examples of how the mining industry is full of stories of human rights abuses, of water poisoning, exploitation, and land grabs. And mining is the economic sector most associated with local conflicts between environmental defenders and corporations with many environmental defenders assassinated. So that's the bad stuff. But what happens if we could look after people and planet with mining that we do? What if the battery industry and its demand for minerals could be a force for reform and a force for good? How do we protect biodiversity and prevent the exploitation of people? Can it be done is the big question. Can we have a positive impact via mining on the communities in the area rather than just exploiting them? So here are a couple of examples of legacy investing where mining companies transform the community positively, building schools, hospitals, and creating proper plans to reclaim the land after the mine closure as well as improving local access to clean water. So there are only small examples, but the fact that they exist is hopefully um, an indication that if we push for it, it can, it can be done. So climate justice in batteries to me means key, three key principles, therefore. So firstly, environmental, social and uh, environmental, social and governance engagements, ESG, between battery companies and mining companies to make sure that all metals mined and used in batteries are mined with community consent and minimal environmental impact. So regulated ESG that adheres to a set of standards will allow companies to hold mines to that standard and allow, it to be, uh, allow increased transparency. It is significantly cheaper and faster to improve existing mines than to open new ones. So several different sets of recommendations exist for responsible mining that emphasize transparency and human rights. So using these holistic approaches will create better relationships between communities, miners, battery manufacturers, and those better relationships will lead to more stable supply chains. So they will benefit, that will benefit all parties. Secondly, continued innovation based on developing battery tech on more abundant materials such as sodium and other up and coming tech. Choosing materials to include in batteries that we can source more sustainably will alleviate pressure on the demand for lithium and allow us to push the bounds of our scientific knowledge. And also extending the lives of existing materials and pushing for increased recycling rates and recyclability. So recently, the EU passed a new law about battery passports, which will require transparency on contents and sourcing of batteries sold in Europe and higher standards for recycled content required. So that better labeling of batteries, standardizing the formats and using bolts and screws instead of welds and sticking things together will make them easier to take apart for recycling, but it will make them heavier and bulkier. So ultimately that can be weighed up as cost of recycling and ease brought down versus weight addition. So striving for this fully circular approach where value in the battery is retained is good for the planet and will eventually also bring down the materials cost for gigafactories once enough is being recycled, if you can retain value in the supply chain for batteries. 
So finally, committing to justice and how we use batteries. So that means prioritizing basic needs such as public transport and community stationary storage and changing our own relationship with demand as consumers. Do we need electric SUVs in cities? The big question. So a 2023 study from the Community and Climate Project at UC Davis models how lithium demand could be reduced in the US by 18% up to 2050 just by decreasing personal car ownership and improving public transport and city walkability. And it was then up to 29% if you did that, as well as limiting the size of a car battery. Good public transport and active travel infrastructure would allow urban populations to move more freely without requiring them to own and run an expensive car and representing more just access to transport. So con connecting that consumer demand and awareness to material supply and its implications would reform our demands on the battery industry and the planet. So this graph shows the lithium mass required per person transported. So for the Hummer, which is a massive electric truck, it's 4.8 kilograms per person at its most efficient. And for a bus, that comes down to half a kilogram of lithium to move one person. And then for an e-bike, that's 0.2. So as minerals demand becomes even more and more squeezed, it will be increasingly important to prioritise mass transport over luxury. And this is also a social justice issue too. So we need to make sure that the batteries that we make do the most per lithium ion. So this translates to my own work that I've been up to at my PhD. So I spent the first year developing some cobalt free cathodes based on nickel, but now we've moved away from this research as the demand for nickel is increasingly high and it's sourcing is also content, increasingly contentious, particularly after the invasion of Ukraine as a lot of nickel comes from Russia. And it's also very toxic. So something else I've been working on is how to evaluate sustainability. So the EU, US and UK regularly release a critical minerals list, which, will, which assesses supply risk and economic importance of minerals. So this takes into account global factors and it's really interesting to apply that then to batteries to show how critical each cathode type is and be able to compare them. And finally, I've been playing about with a different type of battery, which is sodium ion chemistry, as well as lithium, and testing them in various ways to assess them as possible battery materials. It is my strongly held belief that a successful global transformation in energy and transport will be strongly reliant on the battery industry constantly innovating, and that we can't do that without putting climate justice at the forefront of our work. Science is not amoral and the research has broad, beautiful and big consequences. And for me, that's why I do it. So yeah, that's what gets me up in the morning. So thank you very much to Emma and uh, my supervisor, my research group, um, Nicholas, you and the intercalation team for helping me flesh out all of these thoughts and the University of Manchester for the invitation. Um, you can follow what we get up to at Birmingham on these Twitter handles, who one of them is me and one's the group. Um, and something else we do a lot of thinking about is how do we research sustainability sustainably? Um, so you can see some pictures of us doing community litter pick on the bottom left um, and also evaluating our energy use of our different lab equipment. Um, and I also do mega train journeys across Europe to go to conferences, keep the footprint as minimal as possible, which I know you guys at Manchester are very good in, uh, in the Tyndall Centre. So, yeah. Thank you again, everyone. And um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Izzy. Um, wonderful. Um, so first, well, first of all, let's uh, a round of applause for Izzy. So um, questions. Hugh, Hugh, can I ask a few questions? First? Certainly can, Rob. To, uh, so you can take a little break <laughs> before the questions. So. Thanks, Easy. Very interesting uh, talk. Um, uh, I'm always very curious about this mining, uh, so I'm learning quite a lot today. So thank you so much. I guess my quick my quick question about, of course, you talked a, a little bit about oh, if they are, so basically, like of course, a lot of issues to do with mining, but also there's also a lot of um, um, you of course you also said in some very positive cases. We also see a lot of like uh, mining companies improving the well-being in in communities. So I guess my my quick my question here is, of course, you you did kind of a quick look on like what what minimal what, what minerals we need, but do we actually can you give a maybe a big sense of where these minerals are? 
so in the sense that uh, I know, of course, we need to mine quite a lot. Of, I know quite a lot of these metals are in Asia or like maybe maybe some maybe some part, in, let's say said like it's the nickel in Russia. Because I was thinking like in let's say in the next 10 years or so that we need a lot of these metals. Uh, does it actually give maybe a different power, power shifting to some some countries, right? Like say, oh, oh you, you basically say I'm the only country that you, I can mine quite a lot of these minerals and whether that actually leads to a lot of uh, like, it could be conflicts, it depends on where, like if it's in Europe, then I guess, okay, fine, I'll have a bit more confidence. But if it's in say Africa or a, or let's say China or some other country, North Korea or some other these countries, then there might be more worries that we need to be worried about. Yeah, so in the case of lithium, most of the world's supply tends to come from South America in the brines or Australia. Um, and for things like cobalt, it's pretty concentrated in the DRC, so the Congo. Um, nickel, there is some in Asia, there's some in Russia. Um, the, the more interesting thing actually is not where you mine it, it's where you refine it. Um, because refineries tend to be, for some minerals, especially battery ones, tend to be the bottleneck. Um, and a lot of refineries have been built in China. So China has a lot of then power over like those process minerals. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Okay, so did you have a follow-up question, Ron, or do you want to, there's some questions in the chat as well. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. so, so just looking at the questions in the chat, um, is there going to be any resistance to innovation in the battery world? So thinking about, I suppose, the tension between the companies producing the batteries and the companies producing the utilisation, notably the vehicles. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I actually think that a lot of the time the people paying for the innovation are the bat are the car companies <laughs> so if you want to see like where you, where the, where they think the batteries are going to go you need to look at like where the car companies are paying for so things like solid state sodium iron um but i think especially because we have so much pressure on like certain metal supplies um like innovation and diversifying will not like that will not be a bad thing for car companies, um, especially because a lot of them have bought like, you know, a decade's worth of nickel supply. And then they'll be looking at what happens like when we stop getting a fixed nickel price from this company. Like, how do we then um, like what what do our cars look like in 10 years rather than they were? Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that sort of answers the question. Well, so so, so your talk focused on the supply side to a, a large extent and, and 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 you did mention about the, the the issues around sort of sustainability of the batteries later on in your talk but but i guess a question from Janae in the chat is is what's the way forward around the sort of recycling part of of all of this um since the recycling policies and the infrastructure isn't particularly brilliant it's not particularly brilliant in the UK and and the UK is probably one of the more advanced places for doing this so so I guess yeah. you want to know what your thoughts were on that um so this is not my area of expertise so yeah, I'm just going to preface that um but so in terms of so the UK is actually we're not I, I think if you want to look at the places that have the highest adoption it's places like Norway for electric vehicles so be interesting to see what happens there but um in terms of policy, so that is really interestingly developing. So the EU have just voted for this um, piece of policy that will mandate them to have a certain, all cathode material to have a certain percentage of recycled minerals in it. Um, so that will sort of force, that requirement of recycling will then force battery manufacturers to start thinking about, right, how do we get 30% or whatever the percentage is content recycled cobalt into our cathodes? Uh, and then like the innovation will come following the, following the policy, hopefully. But again, it's not my area of expertise, so that's my understanding. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I suppose I suppose I had a similar question to Janaid, really, just to to follow on from that, which was, what you know, ultimately, if you want to get to to 
100% recovery from the materials that are in use at the end of their utilizable, you know, their, their utilizable lifetime or whatever. Um, then, then the extraction is a finite thing ultimately. So, uh, are there projections on what that would need to be and how long it would need to be for? Um, what for re recycling? Well, so if you were to sort of say, let's replace our utilization with batteries globally, it's going mm -hmm. to take us some time to get there. Um, but then ultimately, at the end of a finite period of time, we develop recycling capability to the point that we we don't need further re extraction. So, mm -hmm. is there, are there estimates of the total extractable requirement? Um, um, where do they sit with the geological store? I'm not sure that exact calculation. I, I haven't seen that exact calculation. Um, but I mean, I think something that to think about here is that innovation will then require different metals. So if we're recycling batteries from today in, say, 15, 20 years time, um, we might not still be making nickel based cathodes anymore. So we might just be recycling the nickel and then using it for something else um, and then building something else. So the supply and demand may not match up in terms of recycling and like um, and also in terms of where we're at with the battery recycling at the moment like because we've still got such a high percentage of ice or ICE vehicles on the roads the percentage that we need to re recycle right now for EVs um, isn't that high yet so um, in terms of meeting that I think as that becomes greater and greater problem probably that will be met at the time <laughs> hopefully <laughs> yeah again i'm not really a recycling person so um okay. i recommend you on to talking to yeah uh, there's there's some really good papers out there about different recycling capabilities of different companies wonderful well thank you very much i don't think there's any further questions in the chat so i've not ignored ignored anybody there's some wonderful positive comments in the chat which is really cool and we've reached the end of of our time so I'd like to thank both Ron and Izzy again. Um, both fantastic, interesting talks. I learned a load. It was very stimulating. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, Izzy. It's much appreciated to have an external speaker. Uh, just to say that our next seminar series will be on the 27th of July, and the topics will be nuclear energy and the circular economy. And you can sign up for that through the event by link that Emily's just put in the chat. Uh, so if you go to that now, that'd be cool. Thank you all very much for coming. It's great to see you and uh, hopefully see some of you again in July. Thanks a lot. <laughs>